Hi everybody, welcome to our webinar on rehabilitation in brain and spinal injuries. Um, first up, I'm Anna Pask and I'm a senior associate solicitor in our serious injury team in London. Um, just got a little bit of housekeeping for you, just in terms of um, submitting questions. So if you do have any questions you'd like to ask any of our speakers, then submit them um, as we go along via the Q&A function on the screen and we'll do our best to answer all of them at the end. Uh, when submitting them, if you could put your name and email address, so if we don't get your question, um, we'll respond directly to you after the event. Um, a recording of the webinar and a copy of the slides will also be sent out to you afterwards. And towards the end of the session, we will be posting a feedback link. So please just take two minutes to let us know your feedback if you can. Thank you. Uh, so in terms of our speakers today, um, we have Christopher Wynn with us, who's the Clinical Director of the Rehab Physio Limited, Eva Faber, who's the Professional Services Manager at the Brain and Spine Foundation, and Sarah Balfour, who is a partner in our family department at Owen Mitchell. And our first speaker up today will be Chris Wynn. And as I said, Chris is the Clinical, clinical Director of the Rehab Physio. And after working within the NHS, he chose to specialise in neurology. And then from leaving the NHS in 2010, he became the lead physiotherapist at an inpatient rehab unit before he set up the rehab physio in 2011. So the rehab physio is a specialist state-of-the-art facility on the Wirral in Merseyside, offering robotics and virtual reality to deliver intensive rehab programmes for adults and children with complex needs. So Chris is going to discuss intensity and robotics in neurological therapy. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, Anna. Um, uh, thank you for having me speak today. It's an absolute privilege to do so. Um, I'm going to get straight down to business so I don't waste time um, for our other fabulous speakers, Eva and Sarah. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that there are 168 hours in a week. Um, I just want to park that there. I want you to remember that fact and we'll come back to it later. Um, but where I'll begin is um, to start by telling you a story about a client of ours that shaped a lot of what we do today. It's conveniently a client of, well, was a client of Erwin Mitchell, um, but that's completely coincidental. Um, it was actually the first time I worked with Jonathan Betts and Matthew Garson, but I'm telling you that um, regardless of that fact, um, I'm telling you because it is true that this patient had a profound effect on me and it changed our practice and has done ever since. Um, today, as you said, the rehab physio is a three and a half thousand square foot facility with robotics and technology, which is why I'm speaking to you today. But when we started in 2011, it was just me, a one man band going to people's houses. And around this time, I met this particular client and following quite a high profile road traffic um, accident, he was told that he had a complete spinal cord injury um, in his lumbar spine region. And he was told he'd never have any recovery um, of his lower limb function whatsoever. And when I met him, he had a flicker. I really do mean a flicker of um, hip flexion activity in his right hip and nothing else. No sensation other than um, intermittent surges of neuropathic pain um, and people react in different ways and for different reasons and we all have different circumstances offering different opportunity or lack of opportunity so there's absolutely no judgment on anyone who doesn't react in a certain way following a life-changing injury but this client spurred on by anger at what happened to him um, by being dismissed by his consultant neurologist and aided by his background in personal training, um, he worked and worked and worked with what he had. And when you're on your own and you can only work with what you've got, um, you, you can only do that. And, and he worked it. So we didn't have the same waking hours. Uh, he was quite nocturnal and I used to bang my head on the wall outside his flat trying to wake him up for 30 minutes after his appointment was due. Um, he'd eventually come down, open the door. Um, and, I'd be, and I'd be saying to him, you know, you must be more organized. You need a timetable, a routine to stick to. Um, but I didn't realize that that did just because he didn't work the same way as me, 
or he didn't keep to a routine as I knew it, that he wasn't working incredibly hard. Uh, it just meant he was doing it his own way. Uh, the longer short of it is, he went on to walk again. Um, short distances completely unaided now. Um, and certainly he can stand for a significant amount of time without any walking aids um, um, and, and just moderate orthoses. Um, he walks longer distances with crutches. He walked the London Marathon with crutches and um, he's actually a Paralympic swimmer currently. The point is that he changed my perspective on what could be achieved with intensity of rehab. And since that day, uh, we've been researching and implementing intensity in our rehabilitation. And that is a term thrown around a lot, um, intensity, without proper definition. But the evidence shows that what it essentially equates to is the equivalent of a working day spent, dedicated to your physical recovery each and every day. And this is simply really hard to do on your own. And it's really difficult for service providers to help you with. Uh, which is why we utilize robotics and technology um, in order to do so. I'm going to try my best not to cough or sniff. Okay, <clears throat> so essentially on, on slide two, what we're trying to achieve is neuroplasticity. Um, and it basically all comes down to that, as does most neurological rehabilitation. In simple terms, it's the brain and the nervous system's ability to change and adapt uh, in response to new experiences. It's the way our brains learn to grow, forming new neural connections and rewiring themselves based on the input they receive. But not all experiences are created equal when it comes to promoting neuroplasticity. To promote effective neuroplasticity, we need to engage in activities that are specific, repeated and intense. So specificity quite simply refers to engaging activities that are tailored to the skill we want to learn um, or the function we want to regain. So for example, if a patient wants to be able to reach their arm out, maybe to, sorry, my light's on a motion sensor. If a patient wants to be able to reach their arm out again to um, maybe open a door, um, then the specific exercises we give them would be targeted at that specific function. We break that down. We maybe look at shoulder stability, the ability to reach through the elbow, maybe using triceps control, um, um, selective grip um, and, and, and so on. Um, repetition. Repetition is essential for promoting neuroplasticity because it strengthens the neural connections we're trying to form. So the more we repeat an activity, the stronger those, those connections become. So this is why regular practice is so crucial when learning a new skill, regardless of neurological injury or not. Whether it's playing an instrument, speaking a new language uh, or recovering from an injury, repetition is essential from promoting neuroplasticity, although it doesn't seem to have any effect on my golf game. But um, lastly, intensity. So to, to promote effective neuroplasticity, we need to challenge ourselves. We need to engage in activities that are intense enough to stimulate our brains, to push us beyond our comfort zones. So for example, a patient recovering um, from an injury, many need to engage in intense physical, physical therapy and get exercises to promote the rewiring of neural connections. By pushing ourselves to work harder and faster, we can promote more effective neuroplasticity. And the research supports this. There's, there's research that shows that raising our heart rates to levels commonly associated with gym activity or sporting activity uh, provides the best conditions with which neuroplasticity occurs. And, and also, there's a lot of research out there that shows that, um, you know, like over seven hours a day and thousands of repetitions are required per day uh, to achieve that change. And I just want you to think about for a second how hard that is to achieve if you spend a lot of your waking hours in a chair or a bed. Um, okay, so on to the next slides. Our governing bodies um, and organisations um, that are set up to research and recommend best practice all acknowledge this to be the case. Um, they all recommend intensity of practice, um, but the longer short of it is that they all recognise that generally, as a nation, we are falling short of that required amount to optimise our patient recovery. Um, more, than any, more than ever before, people are living with a physical deficit following brain injury or spinal cord injury. Um, 
at the bottom of the next slide, the Royal College of Physicians released quite a damning quote, um, which is most patients out of them, the acquired range repopulation, most patients receive treatment which is inadequate or inappropriate and delayed. There's alarming statistics about uh, many people who suffer spinal cord injury that don't ever get anywhere near a specialist spinal cord injury unit. Um, and there's a research paper that um, documented um, patients' time spent on a stroke rehabilitation unit. And what they found was that when they observed the patients, on average, 75% of their waking hours were spent as idle time, time not doing anything meaningful with regards to their rehabilitation. And when they did engage in a meaningful rehabilitation activity, on average, they were having 32 repetitions or less per session of um, upper limb movement. And um, when you look at the research, we should be aiming for over a thousand per session. It's well short of what's required. Um, okay, so moving on to the next slide. So if you come out of hospital and the likelihood is from the research and all the bodies that um, talk about this is that you're going to not have you're not going to have achieved your optimal conditions for rehabilitation and then you come out of hospital not experiencing the best conditions and you still want to rehabilitate so you look for outpatient services and what does that look like well i can tell you from personal experience that typically looks like we'll see you once or twice a week for six to 12 weeks and then we'll review the situation see how you're getting on and then make future plans according and that's private that's, that's traditional um input in the private sector i mean in statutory services depending on where you live and depending on the level of your condition and the current resources in your local area you're probably going to get a lot less than that and in reality the research shows that, that simply isn't good enough and that's why we are trying to spread the word that a change in practice mindset and subsequently funding is needed and why we might be underserving our clients by conforming to tired old routines. And we should convey today that an improved, what, what an improved application of physiotherapy looks like and what it can achieve. Um, the issue if, um, that this presents to physiotherapists is that you're a physiotherapist and you've seen the research and you think, okay, I'm gonna work intensively with, with my patients. I'm gonna get the best practice out of them. I'm going to work for several hours a day on this one patient and I'm going to get them as good as they can be. Well, obviously, from a resource point of view, that completely monopolizes that physiotherapist with one patient. And what about all the other patients that are lining up at the door saying, well, I need that gold standard service too. It's very, very difficult to achieve, let alone sustain. So unfortunately, for a long time, people have been prescribed treatment based on organizational constraints and not what is best for them as the individual. And quite often it's passed off as either they've not got rehabilitation potential or it's what's best for them, rather than, I'm sorry, we just can't offer you the best possible opportunity to get better. Okay, um, so moving on to the next slide. Uh, the truth of it is it's all about opportunity. At the beginning of this talk, I explained about how my client worked on his rehabilitation intensively. But he had friends, he had access to gyms, he could self repel a wheelchair and he could transfer himself on and off any surface. He bought home equipment and put it into a spare bedroom where he could rehabilitate himself. But not everyone can do any of these things. So does that mean they can't work intensively? And if the services generally struggle to support that intensity, does that mean they never get access to it? So quite simply, it's common sense that before you even factor in the growing body of evidence to support this approach, that you're only as good as your opportunity to put demand through your body. So how do we deal with this? Well, we've got three tiers of approach, um, and this is where our robotics come into play to help us deliver that. We have an intensive program, which is an 80 hour program of treatment over four, five or seven weeks, uh, depending on whether people come in five days a week, four days a week or three days a week. And that equates to four consecutive hours of physiotherapy per day. Um, with some breaks in between, we're not monsters, you can go to the toilet and we have a lunch break. So actually they're with us for just over five hours per day, which is quite a serious commitment if you think about it. Um, and how we're able to do that um, 
is that we still provide one-to-one -one physiotherapy in its traditional sense uh, for one hour um, of each day. But then the additional three hours um, of physio um, is via specifically tailored repetitive movement made meaningful by our virtual reality and aligned with a person's functional goals so that they are achieving thousands more repetitions in a day and providing optimum conditions for neuroplasticity to occur. We still run our traditional physiotherapy program because it's not suitable for everybody to make that, that level of commitment. Um, so we still see people in the traditional sense that more people would be used to seeing. And we also run a, a gym service um, for people who either cannot afford um, to attend either the intensive program or the physio program. Um, but also um, it acts as a drop down service. So for people who have been in the intensive program, who still need access to specialist equipment, who perhaps can't put it in their own accommodation, can't afford to, haven't got the opportunity to use it, they can still come into our um, premises and use some of that specialist equipment on a gym subscription basis, a bit like you'd normally see in your own regular gym, but obviously it's specifically adapted for neurological rehabilitation. I'm keen, so you, you see on the slides at the moment um, are some of our robotics, um, which I'll talk you through now. Um, I'm very, very keen to let people know um, that there are methods for us to achieve the required intensity and repetition. Um, there are methods for volume, frequency and specificity and the not magic cure. I was at a brain injury conference um, this year in Birmingham and the case manager came up to me and said, oh, it's all right having these shiny robots, but realistically, it's about functional practice. And unless you actually practice on the function, you're not going to get better. And I said, absolutely, it's about functional practice. Um, when people come in, we need to know what they want to achieve. And we have to make an assessment on whether that's realistic. And based on realistic, achievable goals, we will set a program out. And it is absolutely based on function because if you say got a flicker of movement in your arm and you can move maybe a little bit your shoulder, but you can't reach out your arm, you can't move your hand, you can't actually use the arm for function in the real world then you're ne it, it, it's it's self-perpetuating you're never going to use that arm you're never going to use what you've got and try and build on it because there's no meaning to it just moving your arm every day with no outcome for you no positive reinforcement for you it's not going to happen so using the robotics and the technology we specifically design a program maybe we put a sensor above the elbow and below the elbow and using whatever they've got whatever movement they've got they can operate a game and, and succeed or fail at the game according to what movement they've got, but tailored for the amount of movement they do have. It could be such as um, pegging clothes on a line in the virtual reality, but they're moving their arm and they're achieving an outcome. And if you achieve thousands of repetitions of what you do have, then by the time you come out of the 80 hour program, you may well get over a threshold to then start practicing function. And indeed, very recently, we're gonna, we're gonna put a blog on our website about a patient who came down from Scotland. Um, we've worked with the physios from Scotland, a, a lovely team, and they recommended that he came down to us because quite simply, they were seeing him twice a week, but he didn't have any of that meaningful movement to practice anything for himself. So they weren't, they, they knew he was keen, they knew he was capable, but they just didn't have the opportunity with which to progress him. So they recommended he came down. He came down for an ATR program. He's able to move his arm. It's not perfect, but he's able to do a hell of a lot more now. And now he's actually able to practice opening a door by himself. So he's actually able to progress his therapy between his physio sessions. When his physio comes in, he's worked hard on that all week and then they can move it on. Um, yeah. So some of our devices that you can see on the list there. So we've got the Lexa Robotic Gate Trainer. That's essentially a walking machine, put in layman's terms whereby you can achieve up to 4,000 steps um, in an hour. Um, whereas traditional therapy sessions, you might be getting up to 20 maximum, and that's if you're specifically looking at walking. Um, and when you again consider the difference between the two, it's vast. Um, the Omega, the unique thing about the Omega is the, is the adjustable height chair really, and the pedals to it, it looks essentially to the layperson like a sit down bike. It can be used that way, but it can also be used as a cross trainer, a stepper, an ankle trainer. And again, you're operating games, activities in the virtual reality with whatever movement you've got, you're getting a meaningful outcome. So again, you can put thousands of repetitions in a supportive chair if you don't have the stability to um, stand up in Alexa. 
Um, we've also got the uh, Timo board and the Pablo sensors. The Pablo sensors are so versatile, you can put it on any part of your body. So if you put one, again, um, above your knee and below your knee, if you are moving those two sensors, they recognize where they, they are in relation to each other. So you can specifically target any movement across any joint in the body and repeat it and have a meaningful outcome for it. So if you just um, cycle you onto the video, it's just a short one. It's essentially a 15 second video and you can see just how quick and easy that movement is on the Lexo gait trainer. I'm going to assume that video is played. So even if it's not when it has done, you can let me know. You can we can just cycle on to the next one and I'll talk to you about the evidence. So don't just take my word for it, basically. So um, of robotic assisted therapy, um, we, we had a, uh, there's, there's been a Cochrane review of 62 trials involving 2,440 patients. And in that trial, it showed that um, robotic gait training had a positive effect on gait speed, walking distance and basic activities of daily living. It showed that it made people um, less dependent on walking aids and other people um, following its use. It showed that it was most effective in the non-ambulatory population. So people who couldn't walk um, in early rehabilitation benefit the most from robotic assisted gait therapy. And also it showed that robotic therapy in combination with conventional therapy is more effective than physio alone without high risk of adverse events. Okay, and then moving on to our upper limb devices. So we have the Amadeo, which is an end effector machine. So a bit similar to the Lexo gate trainer that you just saw, it has repetitive moving parts. So in the Amadeo, you have your fingers attached to magnets. It can be used as continuous passive movement. Um, or it can be um, used to resist. You could be active assisted, so you can initiate the movement and it will take you through your full range. Um, in the Diego, you have um, your, your upper limb suspended. So if you lack the shoulder stability, but you do have some movement in your arms, um, you can be assisted to move. And again, when you consider working intensively and not monopolizing your service, it allows you to leave the patient to engage in a meaningful activity, the computer and the machine is set up to support you in the right way. So by so you can specify just how you're moving the arm. And in that picture, you can see the gentleman has a headset on and you can actually be fully immersive in a virtual reality world. So a small movement in your arms can equate to function in the virtual reality and you can happily engage in meaningful activity, which is much more rewarding than giving somebody a functional task that they just can't complete. Um, and again, the Pablo, which we refer to in the lower limb ones, can be applied to the upper limb. You can be, you can use it for force, grip, um, resistance, range of movement across any joint. Um, the sensors can be applied uh, anywhere across uh, the upper limb. Uh, and then lastly, the, the Miro um, is essentially a giant screen, which can be put horizontally or vertically, whereby you can weight bear, you can put force through, um, or you can use it for reaching tasks. And again, you've got that patient in the open world. You can put them in any position you want to. If you want to balance them on the weaker side and challenge that side, um, you can do that and then put a meaningful activity on the screen in front of them. It's also got quite a lot of occupational therapy um, tasks on it that can be used. Um, and again, if we just um, switch to the video, um, which should be slide 10, um, and that will show you the different devices that we have available. So the Diego um, is the one with the virtual reality headset, whereby they're immersing themselves in the task. The Miro is the giant screen where we're using, uh, in this particular case, um, a position of imbalance to challenge their core whilst they're reaching. And here you see the um, Pablo sensors in full use either through range of movement or through pressure and then lastly we have the Amadeo with the which is an end effector machine which will repetitively use the fingers you can use that in and out for force grasp you can use it individually for individual fingers because a lot of people take that for granted that fine motor grip and the amount we use um, selective thing, selective finger movements rather than just one big force grip um, is important and that might be specific to their particular goals if something what they want to do is learn to write again you don't have to be um, an advocate for personal training to work intensively. If what you want to be able to do is be able to write again, you can work intensively at those particular tasks which help you 
right again. So there's all manner of different tasks and all different manner of robotics and technology to help you do so. Okay. <clears throat> so just to give you a bit so we're giving you an idea of the research before, we've also got national guidelines support in this method. Um, so to give you an example, the national clinical guidelines that came out this year um, for stroke stated that people with some upper limb movement or impaired mobility or balance should be offered repetitive task practice as the principal rehabilitation approach in preference to other therapy approaches, including bow bath. Now, I I've been trained in bow bath and I'm, I'm, an, I'm an advocate for it, but I'm particularly an advocate for tailoring your approach as to best suits that patient. And I'm also an advocate for using the research and, and, and applying what is shown to work the best. Um, you may not have heard of this other approach, depends on what background you've come from today, but um, it's long been used in physio and still is to this day. And by some, it's used blindly uh, because it's what they've always done by many physios without considering the evidence base behind the approach. Um, and then just onto the next slide regarding the upper limb rehabilitation evidence. So again, another Cochrane review, which again collates a lot of evidence over several different trials. So out of 45 trials involving 1,619 patients after stroke, um, robotic assisted upper limb therapy was shown to have significant improvements in activity to day living, in arm function and arm strength. Um, it was shown to um, work in a, in a combination with conventional therapies. Uh, it was shown to um, increase the intensity of arm therapy by providing more repetitions in the same amount of time, which is exactly what the evidence supports. And um, it was shown for the first time that the well, this particular set of studies, it, it was a high quality, high, strong body of evidence. So it just goes to show you that um, there's growing research that really, really supports this approach. Okay, so the next slide is a video, uh, which I'm going to stop talking for. Um, I feel it's necessary to show you because I think the robotics and the technology are much more um, impacting and understood if they're seen rather than just talked about. So I'm going to be quiet whilst this video plays. So hopefully you can see from that video that not only do you see the equipment in action, but also how it facilitates peer bonding and group working, which has proven hugely successful to our client base who regularly feedback that they form friendships, uh, friendships and they help support each other um, long after they've been here. Indeed, one of our patients has recently bought a standing frame um, for another patient of ours who's in our gym service um, who can't actually afford to attend our physiotherapy services. And he's asked him to pay him back by doing driving jobs for a small business. So not only is he giving our gym user a piece of equipment that will help improve his opportunity to rehabilitate, but he's also given him a sense of purpose and direction, really cleverly done. And uh, by giving him a job role, um, you know, he's given him a real sense of drive and renewed um, reason to rehabilitate. And it's that sort of thing that we obviously see a lot here and it's really rewarding um, and it's, made it achievable by working this way um okay so on to the next slide so intensive outcomes so just to summarize um the robotics and technology enables us to increase the volume of practice increase the quality of therapy provide better treatment outcomes and achieve more sustainable improvements um and the treatment plans that we offer um we offer the tailored programs over 80 hours for four or five or seven weeks um we work the patients for four hours per day we do that using robotic group therapy, which not only 
greatly increases their opportunity to put the, the required repetitions through their bodies to make a difference, but also helps peer bonding. And um, a lot of the time, because it's a vast amount of time, energy and effort to give up, um, people come and stay locally and we have a growing um, directory of um, local accommodation, accessible accommodation that people come and stay in um, and essentially live here and dedicate themselves to their rehabilitation um, as a result. So to summarise it all, repetition and intensity is the key. I'm sorry if I'm starting to sound like I'm repeating myself, but hopefully I will have induced neuroplasticity in all of you as a result. Um, so I just wanted to finish uh, with Steve's story. Steve's one of our patients. What's my light going off again? Um, Steve's one of our patients. Um, Steve was relatively high up in the NHS. He held, a, he held quite a high role. Um, he, as such, he's a staunch advocate for the NHS and he was very guarded and protective coming to see us as a private service. Um, his family essentially cajoled him into doing so. Um, he suffered an incomplete spinal cord injury in his thoracic spine um, when he was lifting heavy garden materials with his younger sons and trying to keep up with them and he greatly regrets that to this day. Um, he'd never been given the opportunity to explore mobility following spinal cord injury, uh, let alone entertain the idea of it, but I will let him explain the rest to you. After an MRI, it was identified that a prolapsed three discs, um, T6 and L3 and L4. Um, to cut a long story short, I, was in, I had to do some complications. Um, I was in hospital for six months as I was leaving hospital. Um, the commentary was around, um, you've done really well uh, for a T6 injury. You've done really well to get where you are now. Um, and you, you may see some improvement in the future, um, but don't live your life um, waiting for it to happen was basically the, the, the party. Went out for a pint with my friend and he he said, is this it? Are you giving up? Um, and I remember being quite sceptical, thinking it's the first time I've ever gone outside of the NHS for care. But from the assessment and from the from the chat, it became very clear very quickly that this was something that I would uh, want to want to pursue. I suppose the first thing that uh, influenced me when I when I came in through the doors was that it's a it's a big bright sort of environment. It looks though it looks though and is that you have all the um, new um, equipment and um, the technology. The, the biggest thing that sort of hit me was, was that people were more willing to be hopeful for you. But what I have had is clinicians um, willing to give you their clinical view um, around what possibly might be around the corner for you if you work out. No one had really um, given me the opportunity to walk um, and since I've been here this is my I'm on the intensive program and this is my ninth day and yesterday on my eighth day I walked across the gym here several times um, supported by a hoist um, but that was there as a safety net as opposed to something that was actually uh, holding me up on it and it was, it was a very, very significant moment for me. I, I think my, my wheelchair will feature in my life, but because of my stay here, I don't think I'm going to be relying on it as much. Um, I think I probably did two intensive programmes um, over that time, and I had a phased sort of exit uh, there was agreed over, over a period of a few weeks and um, when we went down to two days and then one day and it was it was a phased exit. So when I first came um, I wasn't really weight bearing in, in any sort of meaningful way. Um, I was still rolling about on the bed trying to pull my trousers up and, and I didn't have any 
understand when you know when I, I um, and to use the loo, etc. Um, and then when I came here and, and had the assessment, I, I remember Jen saying to me, if you come here and do this program, you will walk. And she said, I don't know whether that's with a frame or with sticks or with crutches, but she said, I feel very strongly that you will walk. And, and at first, um, it, took, it took me by surprise that she had the confidence to say, you come here and do this and, and it will get you to a situation where you're walking. I, I got upset, to be honest with you. Um, and um, I, by the end of the session, I actually um, had a de degree of confidence that this, 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 the rehab physio would, would um, get me to a different place. I'm now able to walk for, you know, several, several hundred meters if I needed to. Um, um, I'm on my crutches most of the time. Um, and life's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And I still daily have some frustrations about things that I can't do. Um, but in the main, uh, I'm in a position where I'm, I'm grateful and, and, um, and I don't know, I suppose I feel, I feel, um, I'm doing more than I expected to do, you know, when, when I came out of the hospital. During that time, while I was here, I, I took my driving test again. Um, and uh, I was classed as able to use a, just a normal um, automatic car without any, any alteration. Um, and it's given me a significant degree of, of um, independence um, that I didn't have before. I think when I first came, I didn't have the, the strength in my legs. Even when I first started driving, I didn't really have the strength in my legs to, to um, fully support me. And I used to back up to the seat and then swing my legs over. But, you know, as, as it is now, I can lift one foot up, weight bear on, on one leg. That goes in and, and, I feel, and it's strong enough to, to hold my weight. So, yeah, great. Life's changed significantly from when I first came. Um, I needed assistance with an awful lot of things. Um, and in the main, I'm, I'm very independent as it, as it speaks now. I'm, I'm able to cook and clean and wash and do all the things that I, uh, everybody else does. Um, my wife's got quite high, high expectations and, and um, doesn't let her get me get away with anything, which is great. No, I'm, I have a degree of independence that I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm able to go out on and um, just live, live, live my life, really. It, life's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And I still have a significant degree of frustration around the things that I can't do. But I do reflect a lot on where I was and where I am now. It's completely different. And I've got a significant degree of independence as a result of, of coming to the rehab as well. Okay, so Steve had never been given the chance to walk. He didn't have any ongoing rehab given to him. He only got to where he got to because he had the opportunity to work in an intensive program uh, augmented by robotics. So just to finish, ask yourself, if the worst happened to you, would you value yourself to the tune of one hour a week of physiotherapy to try and regain whatever function you could? whilst the remaining 167 hours in that week went by without trying? Or would you feel that more was needed? And that is why intensity is required in our rehabilitation and robotics plays a vital role in delivering that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, that was fantastic. Uh, next up, we have Eva Faber, who's the Professional Services Manager of the Brain and Spine Foundation, which is a charity providing professional information and support to those living with neurological conditions in the UK. Eva joined the foundation in 2011, and she now manages the professional services part of the foundation, which consists of the helpline and the peer support groups. So I'll hand over to Eva to tell you a little bit more about the work that they do. Hello, um, 
I'm going to be talking about um, the Brennan Foundation. Uh, thank you, Anna. We're a charity that uh, supports people, uh, adults affected by any neurological condition. Um, and uh, we were uh, founded 30 years ago from a neurosurgeon, Peter Hamlin, who was able to uh, do any surgery that um, that people needed, but who he observed that uh, once treatment was, um, um, you know, one, once he offered his treatment, people were not able to uh, have their needs met um, um, whilst back in the system. So he set up the foundation to support these people and to to cover the gaps. Um, uh, to cover the gaps. Um, next slide, please. Um, so our vision is um, a society where people affected by neurological condition are recognized, respected and can flourish. And our mission is to transform the, dia the daily reality of each person affected by any neurological condition anywhere in the UK through our frontline professional services, innovative social research and campaign for change. We are a change maker organization and we want to give options and to, uh, to enable people to to um, to drive the changes that they want to see. Um, next slide, please. Um, so our services consist of the health, uh, the helpline, our peer support groups, and we also have health information. Um, and uh, with um, we do. Uh, include and involve our community in order to develop um, our services and we get uh, feedback um, from the community who uh, have uh, let us know that you know they they value the fact that our services are professional inclusive credible enabling insightful and creative and I really I really like how um, some feedback we got from uh, one of our peer support groups uh, participants, participants who said that you help and allow people to be more um, than they think they can be. Um, and I think this is important. So just a bit uh, uh, about our helpline. Our helpline is, um, uh, is run by neuro nurses and um, we also have an enhanced emotional support service that we are piloting. Um, we do offer time to people to discuss their worries, their uh, their concerns, and we, we support them across the whole journey before diagnosis, during diagnosis, after diagnosis and treatment, and when they're back at home. Um, and uh, we help them to navigate the system. We help them to summarize their symptoms, um, uh, to summarize the symptoms um, in order to communicate them more effectively to their health team, to get the best support that suits their needs. And um, and um, and uh, with regards to the enhanced emotional support service, um, it, 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 we observed that people needed more time and more uh, ongoing communication in order to manage the anxiety related to the fact that they couldn't access services uh, on time. They have to wait, unfortunately, for a long period of time, either to discuss their diagnosis or to 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 see their um, their health um, their members of their health team. So we we I have set up um, this service that uh, provides up to six sessions um, to ongoing sessions uh, with one of our neuro nurses who is also um, who also has a qualification in counseling skills. And it is uh, would like to share some feedback um, from one of the enhanced emotional support um, service participants um, who had sustained a head injury and she um, she was trying to come to terms and to understand and to manage her expectations once she got back home. And as I said that I would like to say my recovery has been excelled by speaking to the nurse who I had been speaking to for the last six weeks. Just to say that it's not necessary that people will have a session every week. It is tailored to each individual's needs and journey. I can't say how incredible her attention has been reassuring, helping me with my anxiety since my head injury. And um, mm -hmm. Um, we also have our peer support groups um, and um, maybe we can proceed to the next slide if possible. Um, 
Yep, thank you. Um, so we started just just um, when uh, COVID um, started to have our first uh, peer support group, online peer support group, which is the Neurosocial UK wide. And now we have seven groups, two are focused on um, delivering creative activities. All of our groups are co-developed and co-designed with uh, our volunteers and members of the community, and they provide a safe space for people to, to um, express their worries and to um, um, learn from each other. Um, uh, we the, the peer support groups are professionally uh, are supervised from our mem members of the professional team and our creative neuro creatives group is led by on bhcp arts counselor um, who is um, creating specific um, activities tailored to the participants needs we make adjustments for each of the participants to feel that they can they can participate and um, and we have brilliant feedback that um, uh, people felt that their cognitive abilities uh, have been improved. Uh, I would like to share this is a feedback from a lady who um, um, who said that although she has won um, awards in her past, in, okay, I will say it as she said it. I have won awards in my past for work and got localifications, but out of everything, my painting today brings me the most joy and is the biggest achievement because I thought I couldn't do things like this anymore. And I did, and I did it with joy. That was following a brain injury that she had. Um, and we also have our health information, uh, um, which, uh, okay, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, this is some feedback that we, uh, this is some feedback um, that we have collected um, uh, for um, as part of us evaluating and monitoring our services. So people that they are attending the group said that 89% feel more confident due to their attendance in the group, 93% feel part of a community, and 82% feel more able to communicate how they feel and what um, how they feel and what they need to others, which has been amazing to see because we get a lot of people who have lost, um, who have lost their confidence or who feel they, they are not heard or who feel that they don't fit uh, anywhere. And just to say that uh, um, a big benefit of our groups is that they are um, pan, pan neuro, which means that we have patients with various and different neurological conditions and as one of the participants said it really correctly she said we are all on the same on on, on different boats but we're at the same sea which means that they share so many symptoms in common and they help each other and that makes them feel reassured and less less lonely so um thank you and now it's uh, uh, my time to talk about our health information so we uh, work with uh, health professionals to do uh, develop and to review our uh, health information and um, we um, we have our booklets which are available both in print and available online and, and, and the fact is that they're available online um, we can we distribute our booklets free of charge for, to individuals and also to health professionals and just to give you um, um, a bit of, of an, an insight. Last year, over 41 hospitals and other charitable organizations order our booklets, and uh, a majority of our booklets are distributed to uh, hospitals that are physiotherapists, occupational therapists, uh, specialist nurses, um, give to give to the patients to to support them as part of their um, of of them understanding the the condition and managing expectations. Um, so as I said. We have professionals who are helping us with the development and the, and the review of the health information. And um, if we can proceed to the next slide, thank you. Uh, hello. Yeah. So we so we also have our NeuroLife Now social research, which uh, is a platform that it was launched in. 2021 and it captures the daily realities of living with neurological conditions um, in real time and at scale and uh, this is a, a very 
uh, it's an amazing tool for people to to capture their their uh, daily reality and we are working we're we're um 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 using regular surveys and reports we provide a bespoke patient and public and patient inclusion surveys and also we inform and influence international local uh, community and service level and we we are um um we are part of of chains because so far and if we can continue to the next slide please we um we are working with two uh, icss um uh, two integrated care systems to provide public and patient inclusion for their service developments and we have informed the department of health led acquired brain injury strategy and we're working with an hs on the neurology at patients dashboard so that is in a small snapshot uh, the services that we we offer for um, anyone affected by neurological condition. We have uh, we 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 support both patients, carers, family members, and we also have a, a support group for neuro carers. And um, I would like to share Santel's experience, um, but just to give you space from my from my Greek accent, please, Anna. <laughs> Thanks, Eva. Um, I'm going to read out now the story of um, Chantal. So I hope it, I do her justice because she wasn't able to join us today. Ladies and gentlemen, today I want to share my journey with functional neurological disorder, FND, and how the Brain and Spine Foundation's online neurosocial peer support group has played a pivotal role in my life. This group has helped me not only in my physical and speech rehabilitation, but also in nurturing my emotional well-being. It has been a source of strength, a place where I have found friends who understand the complexities of living with a severe and lifelong neurological disorder. My journey with FND has been challenging to say the least. It's a condition that has left me paralysed and housebound, rendering me unable to continue my career in business management. I had built my career through hard work, only to find that my industry was ill-equipped to accommodate my condition. Moreover, the NHS system, which many of us rely on, was under immense strain with long waiting times and limited access to services for those in need. It was a daunting and frustrating time in my life. But it was during these difficult days that I discovered the Brain and Spine Foundation and their online neurosocial peer support group. This incredible community has been my lifeline. It's a place where I've laughed, cried, grieved and shared in joy with people who have become lifelong friends. They have become my pillars of strength, my companions on this challenging journey. Physically, the group has played a significant role in my speech and language rehabilitation. Creative writing and art therapy sessions have been an integral part of my recovery. These activities not only stimulate the mind, but also help in regaling control over my faculties. It's a testament to the power of creativity and the human spirit working hand in hand <clears throat> to overcome the odds. Emotionally, the support group has been my sanctuary. It's a place where I can connect with others who understand the intricacies of living with a severe neurological disorder. When I'm feeling down or overwhelmed, I can turn to this group for understanding and empathy. They've been there to celebrate my triumphs and provide solace during my darkest hours. But this journey is not just about receiving support. It's also about giving back and finding purpose. Thanks to the Brain and Spine Foundation, I was given the opportunity to become a South East lead peer support worker. This role has allowed me to connect with others who are going through what I've experienced. It's a way for me to give back, to be a source of inspiration and to share the hope that life can still be fulfilling even with a severe and lifelong condition. The Brain and Spine Foundation has been instrumental in my journey from the Neurological Nurses Helpline to the creative sessions and the peer support group. Their team has provided a holistic approach to healing. They've helped me find purpose and value in a life that I never expected. They've shown that I can be the best version of myself, perfectly imperfect, just as I am. In conclusion, my journey with functional neurological disorder has been filmed, filled with challenges, but the Brain and Spine Foundation's online neurosocial peer support group has been my beacon of hope. It has helped me physically, emotionally, and has given me a sense of purpose. I'm forever grateful to this incredible community that has supported me and helped me become the best version of myself. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. 
and uh, this is exactly what the organization is, is 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 passionate about is trying to help people to enable people to live well whilst they have a neurological condition and uh, and we are um we are here um and um please um a uh, big thank you to, to all of you that you listen to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva. And I think Chantal's statement probably says it all in terms of the work that you all do. Um, next up, we have our speaker, Sarah Balfour, who's a partner in Irma Mitchell's family team and has been at Irma Mitchell for over 17 years. She heads up our national team and has acted for some of our seriously injured clients who need support with their family circumstances and relationships. Sarah's going to talk about rehabilitation and relationships and how brain and spinal injury can impact upon existing family relationships and the support that's available. She's also going to talk about forming new relationships post injury and how people can protect themselves. Thanks so much for, for that, Anna, and thank you, Eva and, and Chris. Really, really inspirational, fascinating talks. Um, uh, thank you to, to the team for inviting me to, to be here today. As Anna mentioned, I'm a family law solicitor and I head up a team of excellence um, that focuses on and specialises in supporting clients who have suffered either serious injury or they're vulnerable in some other way. Um, and although people who fall into these categories have the same relationship issues as every one of us, the ups and downs are, are often magnified and there are additional or alternative considerations um, that really require some specialist guidance, support and, and experience. Um, that's why I wanted to talk a little bit today about what relationships might look like after serious injury, after brain or, or spinal injury. Um, and I think it goes without saying that intimate and family relationships are, are inevitably impacted following any serious injury. Um, most settled relationships between intimate partners, romantic relationships involve people finding a, a, a particular role and usually in, in good relationships, complementary roles. Um, and when things change, if someone suffers a, an injury, there can be a shift to that dynamic and people can find themselves having to play different roles than they originally did. Um, and that can be from a physical, sexual, emotional, practical perspective. Um, and it can take a, a long time for a, a couple to acclimatise to or, or adapt to that shifting dynamic. Um, if you add into the mix um, a change of temperament or a change in behaviour that may come with suffering a brain injury, it's it's a really heady mix. It's It can be overwhelming. Um, the idea and the place that we come from um, and what we've seen with, with couples that we've supported over the years is that they've described having to work very hard at reclaiming uh, a romantic or an intimate relationship of equals from what may have morphed into a, a carer carey relationship and they've also described having to, to fall in love with each other again or fall in love with someone who might be slightly different than they were before um, and what we found in that situation and in fact in relationships in in general is the key is not to pretend that everything is exactly the same to acknowledge that things are different but also try to get in support and help um, and to communicate better. Um, and communicating better, and it sounds really trite, but it is the key really to, to all relationships. Um, and what we have found is because of all of that, all of those different factors, it, it is very difficult for people to do it on their own. And getting key help in is really the difference between successful um, relationship rehabilitation um, and and actually getting lost within the process. What we have found is key individuals like couples counsellors or couples coaches can actually really assist. Um, coaching perhaps being different from counselling, counselling being identifying the problem, coaching being identifying the problem and also finding practical ways of, of solving it. Um, 
And that's really a, a vital part of rehabilitation, relationship rehabilitation. Um, similar to this, but slightly different, is obviously the relationship between uh, a parent and child. So if a parent has experienced a, a serious injury that has changed their parenting uh, ability, um, the important thing to remember here is even if parenting looks and feels different to what it was before, um, the parent will be able to play an important role, an equally valuable role, but it may just be slightly shifted from what it was before. Um, again, the key is getting in key professionals that can perhaps support um, with the communication and, and finding how that different situation can, can work. Um, one of the scenarios and, and one of the things that we have used, again, with couples and parents that we are supporting um, is bringing in an independent social worker to assist in parenting relationships. Now, the idea of having a social worker and inviting them into a household can often um, fill parents with a feeling of dread and feeling that their, their parenting is going to be scrutinised, but, it, but it's not that. Um, so independent social workers they are used within the court system, but you can also use an independent social worker, an ISW, on a, on a private basis. So you effectively ask someone who is regulated, who has a childcare background, um, and you check the CV to, to find out who is your is the, the best fit for your scenario, and you invite them in to meet with the couple individually and together. Um, but also the, ch the children, again, with parents and without parents, and to help you give some really practical recommendations, so guidance, support, advice on the parenting scenarios that you're facing and the difficulties and adapting to that change of, of dynamic. Um, one of the things that we have to remember all the time is that those of us who are parents, none of us is, is perfect, uh, and actually asking for help and guidance and listening to it in that scenario it is really important and a, and a practical, empowering way forward. Um, another thing we look at alongside relationship coaching or counselling is family mediation. So family mediation is different from the counselling and the, and the coaching because it's about focusing on certain areas of, of disagreement um, so certain differences in opinion um, in, in relation to parenting, for example. Um, and what a mediator does is to find a, a middle ground, but a, but a child focused middle ground. Um, at this firm, so at Owen Mitchell, we focused a lot on mediation and how flexible it can be and how helpful it can be to, to families. Um, we've had a new mediator who, who's joined the team. Um, she's called Joanna Gosling and she worked for a number of years at the BBC. Um, you may know her, but that's her sort of coming into the team has been has brought a real new focus on creative use of, of mediation within existing relationships. So relationships um, where people want to uh, address the problems they have and, and rehabilitate um, how they are going working together. Um, often it's been thought and said that um, our clients who've suffered brain injury or are otherwise vulnerable aren't suitable for, for mediation. It's not appropriate for them. Um, and that just isn't it isn't the case. Um, it's it's a question of potentially adapting the approach that you take slightly. Um, you can use, for example, hybrid mediation. So you have mediation where there is a third party involved who can support and facilitate. That third party can be a solicitor, but can be a non-lawyer as well. The key here is looking at flexibility. Um, one of the other options that, that we look at is child inclusive mediation. Um, so that's where the children concerned are involved within the process and the mediator would at very least speak with them. Um, that is not you know, sitting children down and, and asking them to, to make a decision about what happens in relation to their future. Um, but it's about giving them a voice within the process and about listening to, to children. Um, I've heard it described, so child inclusive mediation um, is 
giving children a voice, but not necessarily the choice. So adult decisions should be made by the adults with the help of, of a mediator who can who can assist creating a, a, a nice constructive solution. Um, but children's voices can and should be heard within the process. So that, that's a little bit about you know, how to look at relationships constructively and, and what expert third parties can do in, in helping with that. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. I think then we, we all, um, I think we all have to acknowledge that sometimes no matter how hard you try in a relationship, no matter what the support is, it, it doesn't work out. Um, and sometimes that's no bad thing because relationships that, that aren't working very often bringing them to an amicable end and allowing people to move on with their lives is very often the best solution for, for them and for their children and for their families as a as a whole. Um, if separation or, or divorce is, is on the cards, then again, mediation is a really positive um, option. Um, and uh, again, it can include children um, and it can include um, third party support, solicitors, hybrid mediation, things like that. Um, the divorce process, so if we're looking at divorce, if that is the, the, the option, it, it's actually now a relatively straightforward one from a legal perspective, putting aside the emotional and other aspects of it. There is at long last in English law a, a no fault system. So you don't have to blame anyone for the for the breakdown of a relationship. You're entitled to your, your divorce um, without having to, to say that it was the other person's fault, which took a long, long time for English law to get there, but we finally have. Um, a, a second important development in English legal practice is that lots of people are using alternative dispute resolution. So settling their financial differences, dividing their finances, settling arrangements for children outside of court, which is a which is a fabulous, fabulous um, development. In that situation, again, um, we would look creatively um, at mediation, at uh, I spoke about arbitration, um, about um, a private process that you go through to try to assist a couple. Um, including a couple where one party may be vulnerable to reach a constructive conclusion to their relationship. Um, sometimes um, it is not possible, obviously, to, to reach an out of court settlement. Uh, and in that situation, we do have to use the, the court process. In around about 90% of, of situations and, and separations, uh, a couple is able to reach an agreement in relation to their finances themselves, so without the court involvement, but on those 10% of cases where actually it's not able, um, it's not possible to find a resolution, then the court process exists. And essentially what happens is that a judge makes a decision about how finances should be divided and how arrangements for children should be um, should be made, what, what should be put into, into place. Important thing to remember about the court process is that it is in this country, in English law, discretionary and it is based on the principle of fairness. And in theory, in principle, that's a fantastic thing because a judge sits and makes a, a decision based on all the facts of a particular case that is that he or she considers to be fair. The difficulty with that is that fairness is a very elastic concept. Um, and it's based on um, a chain of case law that's been developed over the last few decades, but also any individual judge's own perception of what might be fair in the situation. Um, it's really important to understand and to appreciate um, for clients who have particular needs um, or who may have secured a personal injury settlement in order to provide for those needs going forward that um, monies that come in for that purpose are not ring fenced. So the court doesn't put them aside for the purpose that they were intended. And that's really important to, to, to bear in mind. Um, our, our view and our advice always is 
you know, come and talk to us about a situation where you're facing a divorce and you might be um, worried about what happens um, because early strategic joined up advice is really, really important in situations like that. Um, it, it's the same when you're talking about children. So where the court has to make a decision about what happens to children, it's really important to get specialist advice really early on. Um, the important thing from our perspective uh, and what we feel very passionately about as a team is to tackle unhelpful stereotypes that exist and, and preconceptions um, that exist about parenting and parenting abilities and what good in inverted commas parenting looks like. Um, and it's really important to get that early guidance and support so that you go into the process not feeling daunted and that you are as informed as you possibly can be. Um, so then if I could just have the next slide um, where I just wanted to talk a little bit about building new relationships. So um, building new relationships, um, particularly after serious injury, um, can be difficult. Um, they can take time and they require a build up of trust. Uh, this is this is true for for any relationship, but but perhaps more so um, in this scenario, communication is incredibly important. Um, and I will come back to this time and time again, is that when you reach the stage of a relationship where you are thinking about potentially living together, you're thinking about taking the plunge and getting married, it's really important to talk about the future um, and your aspirations, your values, what, what you want to, to happen. Things like, is marriage important? Is marriage completely off the table? Um, do, do, does the other person want to have children? Um, what happens if, if you can't have children? Um, do you want to consider adoption? Do you want to consider surrogacy? Or again, are those things completely off the table? Um, and importantly, what happens if, if we as a couple separate? Do I keep the house that I brought into the relationship? Do I keep the, the nest egg that I put aside for, for my needs, for the future, for additional care and support that, that I may need? Do I get to keep that? Um, what happens to my children from a previous relationship? Who provides for them financially? Uh, and all those questions are, are really important and really important to, to discuss. Um, and one of the things I said about if you do separate in future and if things go wrong, um, then the law can impose an outcome that you may not necessarily want and that you may not necessarily think is fair. Um, very often these questions, and they're really difficult questions and they can feel they can feel uncomfortable raising them, but very often they go unspoken and the first time these things are raised, so you know, what happens if we separate, who's going to get what? Very often the first time that it's mentioned at all, it is in the context of a separation or a divorce. Uh, and often we find is that can, can really be too late because by that stage, trust has broken down and there can be a tendency to think the worst of the other person. There can be bitterness, anger, resentment, all those feelings that don't necessarily bode well um, for sorting out important practical issues. Uh, and what I advocate in a, in a situation like this and, and what I think is a, a constructive way of dealing with things is to talk about them in advance and consider entering into what we call living together agreements. So again, that's just what it says on the tin, you know, an agreement that you enter into when you're intending to live with someone or, or a pre or a post nuptial agreement. Um, one of the things that I've heard said time and time again is that it's really unromantic to essentially enter into a contract when you're wanting to, to live with someone or marry someone um, and that you're you're trying to be cynical. Um, I, I actually don't agree with that. I don't subscribe to that line of thought at all. For me, these sorts of agreements, so these sorts of family agreements are about mutual respect and understanding and sitting down and talking about your commitment to each other, but 
but also your commitment to being fair and reasonable and abiding by what you've agreed previously if the worst happens. Um, and that for me is, is, is what a, a pre or a post nuptial agreement or a living together agreement should really be about. Um, one of the really important things for, for people to, to understand is that marriage in this country under the current legal system is very different than, than living with a partner. There's no such thing as common law marriage, um, despite what you might read in, in, in the papers. A marriage creates very significant rights and responsibilities, including financial responsibilities that can last the length of the marriage and after divorce and into death, um, because it's possible for, for a spouse or an ex-spouse to make a claim against someone's estate. I know that sounds that sounds incredible to many people, but that's the legal reality of relationships. So the most significant contract that most people will enter into at any stage is, is the marriage contract. Um, and it's really important when you're going in with a particular need and a vulnerability um, that, that you think about it. And it's just about going in with your eyes open and informed. And the idea really is that if you have these difficult, maybe difficult discussions at the outset, it actually gives your relationship the best chance of of lasting because you've started on the on the foot that you mean to continue on so you've started with a feeling of open communication and constructive agreement and mutual understanding and, and respect um so that's that's about relationships and, and new relationships um i think don the last slide is just a, a bit of a a summary. So this is just about uh, the family law team at, at Irwin Mitchell. Um, and so as you can see from that map, we are based all around the country. Um, we've got a, a large national team um, with a particular expertise in, in supporting seriously injured and, and vulnerable clients. Um, my contact details are there and I just wanted to, if anybody has any questions or wants any um, any guidance um, then you know, please contact me and we're always happy to have an initial call about your situation or if you've got clients or contacts um, that you know who are in a situation you've just got a question about family relationships and implications um, then you know, please give me a call and we can we can talk through that there okay that's it thank you Anna <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. That was brilliant. Um, I think we're now going to um, answer a few of the questions uh, that have come in so far. Um, right, if we start with you, Eva, um, I think this is directed at you. So how do you manage expectations in the community we have following hospital discharge? So we we talk to people that they um, they have been discharged from the hospital, and what we guide them is to explore what is available in the community uh, with um, the occupational therapist or speech and language therapist, um, such as groups linked to specific conditions, or you know groups like ours, and uh, and also what is available through other charities, and uh, as well. Um, what is privately funded and explore how funding for rehab can be achieved. So this is some things that we are guiding um, people who are contacting um, the helpline or who are, you know, these experiences uh, from people um, participating in the peer support groups. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we've got a question for um, Chris as well. I think we might have a technical issue. I'm not sure if uh, you can see Chris, but he is there and hopefully you'll be able to hear him. Can you hear me? Try. Um, can you hear Chris, me? Chris, are your intensive programmes for both peds and adults? Um, yes, the short answer is yes. Um, obviously with children, um, intensive, the intensive approach of working, um, can be less tolerated uh, depending on the age of the child um, i'm not sure if we can hear chris can you hear me can anyone hear me sorry chris will hopefully um hopefully come back in a second um eva we have another one for you as well um how do you manage an overactive bladder in sci 
Uh, well, uh, we suggest people to um, to uh, discuss their medication and liaise with specialists. Uh, it is important to keep a fluid diary to check if any is uh, contributed, you know, any contributing factors as well, as, for instance, such as caffeine. And of course, we do signpost to, uh, you know, we explore how people can get uh, um, a referral if they haven't done so far to continent services and um, additionally there are charities such as you know let's say the spinal injuries association that they do have good information and we refer people uh, and we, we refer people to 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 relevant services um so we 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 do that and chris is back so that's that's good <laughs> yeah thank you chris is back yes yeah. Um, Apologies. Chris, you missed the last question. Um, are your intensive programs for both peds and adults? Um, yes, yeah, I even started answering it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, essentially the short answer is yes, but obviously with children it's not as straightforward, depending on the age and, and the capability of the child, they may not be able to reason um, if an intensive program um, is quite tough and demanding, um, so it would have to be in, in the child population, it's very much more a niche approach. We have had children on the intensive um, program and we have had successes, uh, most notably with a CIMT approach, constraint induced movement therapy, and mostly in the summer holidays uh, where they've got that time. But even then, when you're considering a child, they may need that time with their family um, to down tools and um, spend a bit of quality time. So children are accessing the intensive program less, but it is suitable for the um, right person. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and one for you, Sarah. Um, are you seeing an increase in requests for prenup agreements in personal injury cases? And do you think more needs to be done to, to raise people's awareness of, of the need for them? Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, the the answer, Anna, is, is yes to, to both, absolutely. So we're seeing a, a lot more awareness of pre and post-nuptial agreements and their importance. Um, and the law is also reflecting them um, in decisions that are being made much more frequently. So they are really worth the paper they're written on. Um, I think a lot of people are finding that it's they're not just for I don't know, celebrities and glossy magazines and and americans they they actually have practical usage particularly in situations where you're protecting personal injury damages so the answer is absolutely that there, there does need to be more done as well to spread the word um so i tend to to tell everybody that that may come into into contact with with people who who could be affected by it really really important Great, thank you. Um, another one for you, Chris. Uh, do you see an increased engagement from clients compared to when you weren't using robotics as much in treatment, and as as they are seeing more tangible results and nuances quicker? Um, yes. Um, obviously, there's a, a novelty factor to robotics, but beyond that. Um, the virtual reality associated with the equipment um, can be made more meaningful. Obviously, you're still going to try and do the same things that you do in traditional physio. You try and make it relevant to them. Um, if they play golf all their life, you're going to try and tailor it to um, their passion and what, and what they do and what the goals they want to achieve. Um, it's very difficult to sort of um, compartmentalize that into different people with spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury it's so varied and people's needs can be um capability can be so varied um as to whether or not that specifically increases their engagement but most notably the amount of time they spend in house with us um you know they spend four hours of therapy a day as opposed to in and out so you do have a lot more um external control on the influences um that you're placing on somebody and and that can really help engagement rather than leaving them to their own devices in the community Brilliant, thank you. Um, I mean, you've probably just touched on it then, but th this is one for you, Chris, and probably you for Eva as well. Um, just how do we maximise patients' engagement in rehab with both a spinal cord injury and a TBI, would you say? We come to you first, Chris. 
I'm sure, yeah, no problem at all. Um, I, I kind of probably touched on that in the previous question, to be honest, in the fact that you have to tailor it to be to be um, individual to them. So when if you're trying to maximise their engagement in their therapy, you try and make it as meaningful as possible as to why they're there. And indeed, on our initial assessment, um, as much as I am history taking, as much as I'm taking objective assessment, I'm looking at how they move, and what I can do for them. One of the most important questions I will ask is why are you here? Um, and what do you want from coming here? Um, and as I touched on in the talk, um, we have to decide whether or not this approach is suitable for them based on that, um, and therefore tailor that program as suitable for their needs as possible. And in particular, there's no better rehabilitation than find something you love uh, and keep doing it. Um, so the more we involve that in their rehabilitation, the better. Can I add as well um, on that, that it, we, we encourage people to, if possible, to attend, to attend rehabilitation sessions with uh, loved ones and to discuss together um, the goal setting meetings and, um, and um, just to involve the family if they have family because that can motivate people in their journey. And of course, I echo what we said with regards to tailoring to its individual needs. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Um, that's probably it. We've got a couple of questions left that we probably didn't have time to get to, but if we haven't answered the questions that you've sent in, then we will get back to you um, directly by email if, if you've left your email address with us. But thank you everyone for attending today. We hope you found it helpful and informative. Um, we will send you out a link with um, the recording of the um, of the session today so you can watch it back. Um, we will also be sending you some links. We have some webinars coming up next year in AI, um, so we'll be sending you out some information in relation to that as well um, if you'd like to join. Thank you everyone.